If you have just joined, uh, let me welcome you. Um, we are here to discuss the first steps in job expectation and job search. After a grueling undergrad residency and fellowship, this is the first time you're stepping out of uh, to practice on our own, right? So it's, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Aurelia Wood. She's an end endocrinologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. She obtained her medical degree at Wright State University Boonshaw School of Medicine in Dayton, Ohio. She completed her pediatric residency at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Louisville, Kentucky. She's double board certified in general pediatrics and pediatric endocrine and diabetes. She is the co-director of the type one diabetes program and a co-medical uh, co director and co-founder of the diabetes and school health program. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, cooking, walking, uh, watching and uh, playing tennis. You can uh, often find her and her husband hanging out at homes um, uh, with their dogs, working on ho home improvement projects, watching movies, nurturing their growing collection of plants. Welcome, Dr. Wood. Thank you for that warm welcome. Can you All right, perfect. Well, I can't see you any longer. So of course, um, I know the chat will be moderated. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, but as was stated, this is a brief talk about a very important um, and weight, weight, heavily weighted topic. Um, finding a job, that last step, and the expectations for the first job. So it's one of those conversations that you want to have over coffee with your mentors, with your colleagues, with fellows that have graduated ahead of you, because there are so many different considerations. We all have different career paths and different interests. We may be clinician educator focused. We may be focused on QI or research. Um, and this talk will mostly, especially once we get to what to do once to get to the job, maybe focus more academic because of course that's my perspective, but certainly we'll have um, information that'll be helpful for anyone, no matter how they're navigating through and what their uh, career intended path will be. So we all have different ways that we think about making big decisions. What's my job gonna be? What am I gonna do once I've finally completed that last milestone in my academic medicine training? Some of us may be more conceptual and we have a vision for what we think we want our career to look like and we let that just guide our decision-making. Some of us may be directive and we might see what we want and we might be able to make quick decisions. Some of us may be more behavioral and really consider our relationships and the dynamics of all the different personal professional considerations before making these kind of decisions. And some of us, self-included, are analytical and we kind of sit back, are a little bit comfortable with that ambiguity and really navigate through making decisions by carefully examining all the different aspects. Um, but no matter what your perspective is, no matter what your career path is, I'm hopeful that this talk will help you at least have some objective milestones and information to guide you on that path, make it a little bit more clear, and get you towards that goal of getting towards your career path. So first year of fellowship, <clears throat> um, of course your main concern is being a fellow. You go from on June 30th to being a pediatric resident, an adult medicine resident, or whatever your primary residency was to an expert in endocrinology. So of course your main focus is that clinical piece and becoming a, a expert in your new specialty. However, we do have to want to start thinking about this part, this career development, even early on. Some easy first steps to take are suggested here, including making sure your CV is updated. At this stage, when you're in fellowship, you really will be concluding things from residency and medical school, may no longer need to include things before that time, unless they're very big, very impactful, or somehow really directly related to your current career path. You also want to start to do some brainstorming, which your program leadership will help guide you with doing um, about what your QI and your research projects will be. And as a part of that, you should really start looking at that conference calendar. So all the different endocrine, pediatric endocrine associations and organizations, really looking through their websites, getting really familiar and finding all those different conferences that will take place. Not only are they excellent opportunities for learning, but they're great for networking. Unfortunately, we're doing that virtually, but still there are opportunities here because we're still gathered together in a large group. Um, but that's a great place um, that I found during fellowship to meet different fellows, to meet attendings and faculty from different institutions with different backgrounds, different career paths, to really start just getting the wheels turning of what the different options are once you're complete with fellowship. 
Of course, within your fellowship, you'll begin identifying mentors, but also start to think of those people as someone who will help you with your career development, not just your research, not just your QI, not just your clinical work. By the winter time, you wanna revisit that CV. You've probably done at least a few presentations. You may have gone to a diabetes camp or done some other experience. So keeping that updated as you go along is really important because you might get six, down, six months down the road and forget all those great things you've done. So the best way to keep it updated is to do it at least every six months, optimally updating it as you go. So you give a lecture, put it on your CV that same day. That's also a good time to just casually familiarize yourself with the job boards that are available so that the first time you're seeing them isn't when you're actually looking for a job. So there are various job boards that are available that have like a gross perspective of available positions. Of course, the American Diabetes Association has the Pro Career site, which has a really nice um, navigational tools that really can help you tailor figuring out where are available options and where are open positions for the job that you may want. For adult endocrinology fellows, um, the Endocrine Society also has a great endo careers um, portal to help find um, different positions. And then for those in, of us in pediatrics, the Pediatric Endocrine Society job board is probably the primary place that we go, especially if we're looking for a career in academics. Everyone doesn't go into or stay within academics. So there are other job search um, navigation portals and other methods um, that can be engaged as well that function the same way. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that in the breakout sessions. So once you've kind of gotten to that portion, you're actually near the end of your first year. Um, so what you wanna do, of course, at the end of any big milestone, or what, at least what I find is helpful for me, is really reflecting and then planning for that next stage. And in this context, that includes career planning. So what does that reflection look like? So when you sit back, some questions that you might wanna ask yourself are what's working and what's not working? So what things are going really well? What am I feeling comfortable with? What are some things that I may need? What's not really working? Do I need more clinical experience in a certain area? Do I need more experience teaching? Do I need more experience in some other aspect? So really just critically thinking about what you need and what's not working. And then what do you need? So do you need another mentor? Do you have a research mentor, but not really someone you can talk about personal and professional development or work-life balance? All those things are important and are also important to think about as you are thinking about career development. You also wanna think about after that intense first year of a lot of clinical service, what do you like about endocrinology? And what do you like about medicine in general? Because those two questions will help you maybe begin to answer the question of what do I wanna do when I'm done? So if you find you love inpatient just as much as outpatient, you love teaching, maybe you wanna stay in academics. If you find that there's a niche opportunity or a niche subspecialty within our specialty that you like, and you have seen someone do it in a way that you find to be very interesting and intriguing, talking with that person and seeing how they got to that space is very helpful as well. And then you definitely, if you haven't already, want to put all that together because it'll help you determine what are your goals for personal and professional development. So a tool that can be very useful in um, keeping that organized and really sitting down and having reflection is something called an individualized um, development plan. But not every, everyone's not that um, detail oriented. So some people may just wanna kind of scribble down, just have an hour or so where you just kind of sit down, just write down what first comes to your mind as you're going through this reflection. Some people may wanna talk it out with a friend, with a co-fellow, with their mentor. And some people might just wanna on their own, just really sit back, reflect and think. Whatever works best for you, I highly recommend picking a time and putting it on your calendar for at least an hour or so to really sit back and reflect at the end of that first year and ask yourself those questions. That individual development program that I mentioned is a tool to help organize, objectify and plan progression through your goals. So if you look online, there are many templates that are available for individualized development plans. Um, they can be as detail oriented or as broad as you could find them to be. But I find um, that this type of organization system with dividing my goals by different category and then looking at the different timelines in the future is helpful to do that. So here we have clinical, 
research, QI, academic and career goals, and then other, which could be personal or um, other professional development outside of your primary um, endeavors as an endocrinologist. And a lot of times doing that reflection of saying, I think I see myself as X, Y, and Z helps you know that five, 10 year, and then will inform what your short-term goals might be. So for the end of the first year in clinical endeavors, you may say, I just want to survive, get through these six months, and that's fine, and you all will and probably have. But you may say, I need to increase my comfort with X, XYZ skill, XYZ um, um, diagnosis. With research, you may have specific um, goals that you and your mentor and your, um, your, your support group are working on, but you want to at least have some goal that's tangible, that has a date attached to it. That way you stay on track because time goes by very quickly. And these three years of fellowship progress faster than you can think. And I'm sure those of you that are in that third year can attest to that. But if you are someone who is more objective and kind of needs that timeline, creating a document like this that you can always go back to, update, reflect on, helps keep yourself accountable. So second year, same thing. You want to start out by updating that CV and looking at that conference calendar and plan on attendance. You also want to start thinking about making and updating the materials you're going to eventually use to apply for your jobs at the end of your second year, the beginning of your third year, and start having a little bit more serious conversations with your mentors, with your peers about job considerations. You want to then go back to those job boards and see what's available, see what's in flux, see what may seem attractive to you, just so you have a finger on the pulse of what's going on. And then at that time, you're probably going to be finalizing up your research kind of heavy in that aspect, still doing your clinical work, but remembering all those contacts you made when you were going on your, um, on your uh, conference journey. So reaching back out to people who are the institutions that you may have seen on the job boards that are interesting to you. And then at that point, you want to start really finalizing your application materials by that second um, spring because you're going to be applying for your job soon. That's also the time that you're going to want to start requesting letters of recommendation from those who you want to write your letters. So what are these application materials? So as was mentioned, this is kind of the first time that for many of us, unless we worked in another area before we came to residency and fellowship, that we're going to be actually doing a standard job application process. Errors and an algorithm no longer determine our fate. So some things that we haven't necessarily had to use before will now become important for us. So your CV, as I mentioned before, keeping that updated will be important and making sure it's in um, a nice format that's very um, organized and and, um, fluid throughout. So that's going to vary by institution. Every institution will have a different template. So you just use the one that's um, recommended by your institution and use that as a template. We've all had many multiple personal statements by this time, but you'll want to have that just in case the, um, the place that you um, interview asks for one. It's not as universal as other stages of career preparation to, to this point, but some places still do ask for this document. And of course, the letters of recommendation with the most important part being timely information and timely request to those who you want to write those letters. Some of the things that we may not have had to create before include cover letters and then kind of templates for messages to send to people and send to institutions and send to prospective jobs um, that are indicating our interest. As it says here on that last line, you want to tailor to each institution and the available position, which is also a little bit different because to date we kind of have used blanket materials. So a cover letter is really a document, a one page document, about 250 to 400 words. That is almost a, a it's telling the story of what you've done to date and why and what your next goals are in your job. So if you've been doing this reflection, maybe made that IDP, have been talking about what your journey through fellowship is and maybe what you wanna do, writing this will be easy. It's not a personal statement, so it's not just your personal account of what's drawn you to the job, but it does allow you to show things that a CV and a personal statement may or may not be able to do. So putting together the journey, so highlighting the things that are important to you, highlighting what your specific skills are, highlighting what kind Kind of institution or position you're looking for and maybe why where you're sending the letter meets those requirements. So it allows you to kind of tie in both your personal and professional development in a one simple document in a way that the CV and the personal statement do not do. 
Um, I have a template here that we can certainly share with the group um, that I've shared with prior fellows and, and my co-fellows as well, um, because again, it's something that we haven't had to do. And of course, there are multiple different um, templates available on different professional development websites. Um, but again, it's really showing the story of who you are in a succinct way and really capitulating what's important to you and what will make you special and what makes you a good addition to the place you're applying to. Some places don't require this, and they may just request information from you, your CV, your personal statement, your letters, and then you'll just send kind of a standard little message along with that. And this is an example of what that may look like. So just a brief introduction saying you were happy to receive notification that this position was open and just asking if they need anything else. So again, we've all asked for letters of recommendation multiple times along this journey. So most of us are familiar with how to do that. Um, but again, the, at this stage, what makes it a little bit different is that we're gonna be potentially looking at multiple different types of jobs. And so we want our letter writers to really understand what our goals are, where these letters are going, so that we have the best chance for success. Because we know that that personal attestation, that personal interaction, that strong letter can really be helpful when we're looking for a new position especially if it's someone that you're not close to. So let's say you have a really big division and you don't really have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone, um, but you think it'd be useful to have a letter for them because you've had positive interactions. It's nice to kind of template out and prepare how you're gonna ask them for that letter. Optimally, you'll do it in person. So saying, hey, as you know, I'm looking, I'm starting my job search. I would be you know, delighted if you would, would grace me with a, with a letter of recommendation. Of course, most people will say yes. But again, here I have a template for a way to ask someone that maybe you're not seeing in person, maybe they're out, or maybe you don't have as close of a relationship with, but still one that warrants their ability to write you a strong letter out. And what you want to include, even if it's someone that you know well, is where you're applying, what kind of institutions or positions you're looking for, um, what region of the country or regions of the country you're looking for, what career path you see yourself on, um, and then you can even give them the list of those institutions. You also want to give them a good deadline. So again, asking far in advance because everyone's super busy and these all tend to accumulate at the same time of the year. If you have an IDP, you want to share them with that, but of course your personal statement and your CV, especially if it's someone that kind of peripherally only knows some of the things you're doing. So who do you send what? So you'll send, again, your personal statement, CV, plus or minus an IDP if you have one to who's writing your letters. To potential employers, only send what they ask you for. So if they ask for two letters, don't send 17. If they ask you for two, don't send one. Make sure you are, you are sending them exactly what they're asking for. There may be places you're interested in applying that don't have an active listing, and it is not inappropriate to still try and figure out whether or not they are potential employers for you. So you've searched on all the boards, you've asked around, you've asked your faculty from other institutions, hey, do you know if they're hiring? And they're not sure. It's always appropriate in a polite, um, professional manner to reach out to see if there are um, positions available. So especially if you've maybe had a, a colleague or another faculty member who has a relationship that could facilitate the in introduction, that can be helpful. But again, that may not be the case. So in that case, you may want to just write a, a brief, succinct letter that includes a like short form of your cover letter to briefly introduce yourself, your interest in learning whether or not they have a position and then thanking them for their time and consideration. Sometimes this can open up doors that were not obviously open, or you may learn that someone, a, a group is in transit and that maybe a position's not available right now, but it may be. And it's always nice to, to reach out and to feel comfortable making that step because again, you're, you never know. The worst that can happen is that they say they're not hiring, but thank you for the inquiry. The best is that they could open up conversation and it may lead somewhere down the line. So now we're in third year. So at this point, you've thought about what you want to do. You've reflected on that. You've gone to conferences. You've done some networking. You've done some presentations. You've met some faculty and fellows from other places. You've looked on the job boards. You've identified what kind of career you want and where you want to go. You've prepared all your documents that are ready for submission. And you've requested your letters. So the only thing left to do is send those application materials in. And once you do that, you'll kind of feel like a sitting duck. It's very stressful. It's one of those kind of like push the button like when you're submitting your heiress, but usually 
when you submit an application, you'll hear back within two to three weeks this is usually the general timeline, sometimes quicker, but in general, you can expect to hear back within that time frame. At academic institutions or hospital systems, they'll often either then set up a conversation between you and the recruiter or you and their HR group or you and their chief if they are interested in learning more about you and potentially offering you an interview. So that conversation may be like a 15 to 30 minute phone conversation, um, even pre-COVID, where they just want to get to know you, maybe give you some more details about the position that maybe weren't available in the job listing and kind of really gauge your true interest. Because, of course, um, people receive many, 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 many requests um, and they receive many, many, many applications. So they really want to tailor who they're interviewing to those who are truly interested. But that's also your opportunity to ask questions as well. Because remember, you're interviewing them just as you're as they're interviewing you. Again, this is, you know, training is really important. Selecting the, the right place, the right vibe for a place to train is really important. But training has a deadline. Your first job may not be your last job, but it has the potential for that. So really you wanna take that opportunity to ask some baseline questions, nothing too invasive, but if there are deal breakers, if there are things that you absolutely need, that is the time to let them know. You don't wanna wait until you get to the interview to say, oh, by the way, my spouse, significant other is a XYZ physician and will need a position. If that's something that is in your journey, you wanna let them know those things up front. And that looks different for everybody. And some people may not have any deal breakers or needs, but if you have special considerations or things that may be important for them to know before proceeding further, that would be the time to do it. Thereafter, if they're interested in offering you an interview, you'll get an, an invitation to do that. If they haven't yet received all of your letters from your letter writers, then they'll request those as well and then formally set up that interview. So interviews. So again, we've done these before for medical school residency and fellowship. And most of us are, are pretty well versed and remember how to prepare for an interview. We all know that there are certain tips and tricks that we want to adhere to in terms of professionalism, preparation for the conversation, you know, things like maintaining eye contact, just those personal touches, those professional touches that make the interview go smoothly and make you seem professional and help you to be comfortable. But again, this is a different type of situation. And so there are a couple of things that are a little bit different. So once you do um, get that notification that you've been invited for an interview, you want to let your program director know and your program coordinator and your chief. Of course, they'll likely be very happy for you, very excited and very proud, but you want to update them on at least those three people on your status, especially because, as we'll talk about in a minute, the interview process is usually a little bit longer, and so you'll need to do some planning ahead in terms of clinical responsibilities. If you feel obligated or if you need to, you may want to also let maybe the nurse you work closely with or maybe a co-fellow know you're going to be out of the office at that time, or at least at the least, if you're not feeling comfortable for any reason sharing that you're going on an interview, just setting up that auto-reply email so people know just, uh, just another level of professionalism so um, people aren't expecting communication when you're very busy and then you don't feel obligated while you're in the interview space to be doing all these different things that could potentially wait until you get back. You'll usually receive the itinerary for the interview process about two weeks ahead. Like any other interview, you want to be prepared. At most interviews at academic institutions, you will meet the majority of the clinical faculty. So I would recommend, and some of you may have done this for other interview um, positions, kind of going into PubMed, going through the website, looking through people's professional profiles on their institution website to get to know who they are if you already hadn't done that. You wanna prepare specific questions for your interviewers. You want There's always questions that you'll probably ask everybody, but you really wanna get the feel of what it's like to be an attending a faculty at the institution. So asking questions about professional development, about mentorship. If you're a research person, especially, you may have very specific questions about that, but you you want to be prepared with questions because every interviewer is different. Some people may have the standard kind of icebreaker, get to know each other and then have questions for you. But some people may come in cold, sit back and say, tell me what you want to know. So you want to use up that time. You want to utilize that time that they've set aside to meet with you in the best way. You also want to just, again, think back to that story of your, your um, journey from fellowship to faculty. So again, just reviewing and thinking deeply about what that cover letter entails and what all you've done thus far entails so you can really share with them how you think you will contribute to being as a part of their group. 
At most interviews at academic institutions, you'll be asked to give a talk of some sort during your interview time. So it may be an endocrine grand rounds, it may be a case. If you're doing a research position or looking into something that includes research, they may ask you to give a research preparation. So they will inform you of that when you have that one-on-one -on -one talk with the recruiter or the chief, um, but you wanna make sure to practice that a few times as well. So then practical things, of course, booking your travel, making sure you've got a nice, well-fitted suit, a couple different shirts you can rotate out, extremely comfortable shoes. You'll be doing a lot of walking, again, practicing that talk a couple times and putting it on a non-password protected jump drive in case it's too large to get onto um, their system. You also want to, especially if you're someone who is um, more analytical, bring like a notebook to write things down. But I honestly recommend that everybody do this. It's gonna be kind of a fast paced time. You may be a little bit um, happily anxious, but there'll be a lot of information and a lot of different type of information. And you're gonna meet a lot of people on that time. So you wanna be able to write down things that when you're reflecting on the interview will help, make, help you make decisions about whether or not it's the right place and help you remember things to ask in the next phase as well. Because again, the interview is a two way street. So you wanna make sure you hear from them the things you need to make you feel comfortable that this position would fit you. If you don't have them, it's okay, but I would, if you do have them, advocate bringing business cards with you. Of course, most people are going to have your information, but sometimes you run into someone in passing or you run into someone who is kind of an add-on to your interview experience that may not have had the full opportunity to review your package in full. So it's nice to be able to have that to hand to them in that moment so you can keep in touch and communicate. Just another little added level of professionalism. So the interview is a little bit different than our residency and fellowship interviews. Again, for academic institution, they're usually two days in length. So the structure and the exact schedule may vary, but many times somewhere between arrival and departure, you'll have dinner with some faculty members. You may even have lunch or a breakfast um, with the fellows. You'll have a tour of all of the facilities that you're gonna be primarily working at. You'll give your talk and of course you'll have your interviews. And depending on the size of the faculty and the job you're applying for, you may have a couple interviews or you may have two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, many, many interviews. So it can be a very lengthy, somewhat draining process. So again, as much as you can be prepared to be on and be professional and be able to sell yourself and be able to interact and feel comfortable by all this extra preparation, the better. Some institutions, most institutions will also have you meet with HR where they'll answer some of the more um, practical questions. So leave, salary, expectations, um, some of the more technical aspects, um, some questions that you may have and haven't had an opportunity to ask yet. Some places may actually also have fun add-ons. They might take you like on a night tour of the city. They might have a um, real estate agent drive you around and see different properties in the area so you get a feel of if I move here, if you're coming from out of state, where might I live and what might I do? So every interview um, session's a little bit different, but typically they're two days in length. So after you've completed your interviews, you're gonna to wanna to take a deep breath. They're lengthy, as I mentioned. It's a lot of information. You met with a lot of people and it's a big, big decision. So allow yourself some time to decompress and just kind of breathe and then go back to your notes, go back to your checklist, go back to the questions you asked and then start to really process that, that um, experience with that institution. Thank you, emails are still um, welcome. So in prior days, many of us did, um, you know, like actual thank you cards, but thank you emails, especially if you had a really good connection with someone um, and wanna mention and help them remember your interaction by mentioning something that you guys talked about are very helpful. Um, and it's also an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions. So most people will say, please reach out if you have any questions, absolutely do so, absolutely do so. Once you're finished an interview with an institution, you'll usually get an email within about a month that'll contain one of the following. They may give you an offer letter. So this is a document that has kind of the basics of your duty, salary, time off. It's not a formal contract, but it is a document that's saying we are interested in hiring you. And by signing that, you're committing to um, continuing in that process. So that offer letter is a really big step in, in, the, job, um, in the job application process. 
process. It's also a time to have further conversations. So maybe they aren't offering you a letter at that time, but maybe they have follow-up questions for you based on your conversations during the interview, or they may have specific questions about how to best craft your offer letter based on what they find that you need, what you um, can contribute and what they and how they envision you fitting in with their group. Or they may notify you that it was a pleasure to meet you. However, they're not going to continue in the interview process and in the intake process at that time. When you get any of these communications, you want to respond in a timely manner within about two days to thank you for thank them for the opportunity um, and respond to their questions. So they may, if they give you an offer, they may give you a time frame in which they want to hear a response. But if not, it'd be optimal to give them an expectation of when you're going to be able to respond. Because even if you feel strongly, you still want to take time to think about it and review that document. Because again, this for most of us is the first time we've had to do so. So what's the difference between an offer letter and an employee agreement, AKA a contract? So in both cases, you wanna reply promptly when you receive it and give them notification of when they can expect a response. Because again, depending on when you interview and how they're lined up in the year, you may interview somewhere, hear back from them before you even finish your other interview. So you wanna be conscientious, you wanna be transparent while also protecting your privacy that you're allowed while you're still navigating through that time. You always want to let them know if you have questions and outline them carefully when you get either document. And the tone of your response should, for both, reflect your true feelings. So if you really don't think that a place is a match for you, despite back and forth, I would avoid being overzealous and over positive if that's really not how you truly feel. Um, the, okay. So again, Yes. I, I am so sorry um, to interrupt. Uh, I think we are out of time. Okay. Um, uh, would you be able to to send a little bit of this um, to to our uh, audience today later? Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I truly appreciate all the tips you provided and um, I think this session should be an hour, two hours. Um, uh, it's it's an important one. Thank you so much.